It's October 24, 1935. Well-known New York-based mobster Dutch Schultz is sitting down for a meal at the Palace Chop House restaurant located at 12 East Park Street in Newark, New Jersey. Sitting alongside him at the same table are three other men. Otto Berman, his accountant. Abraham Landau, his chief lieutenant, and Bernard Rosencrantz, his personal bodyguard. Seems like a normal, relatively cold fall day. However, things would soon change for the four men in the restaurant. Schultz excuses himself to go use the men's room when suddenly, two strange men enter the restaurant. Charles Workman and Emmanuel Weiss. Workman walks over to the bar and makes his way over to the men's room, where he comes face to face with Schultz. Without a moment's hesitation, Workman opens fire, Schultz falls to the ground, and his two killers advance on the rest of the table. February 28, 1906, Benjamin Siegel is born into the family of Max and Jenny Siegel in Brooklyn. Growing up as the child of Ashkenazi Jewish parents from the then nation of Austria-Hungary, Siegel would spend the majority of his young years in the Williamsburg neighborhood. Contrary to his later life, Siegel's upbringing was marked by poverty and intense hatred of that poverty. Siegel's parents barely made more than small, meager wages working whatever jobs they could. This created a lasting mark on him, and he desired so much more. Deciding that he was through with his state of living, Siegel would leave school at a young age and join a gang on Lafayette Street. At first, Siegel and his fellow gangsters committed mostly thefts, but this would change when he met a man named Mo Sedway, another young gangster who had a similar start to Siegel, and both had similar motivations. The one thing both men wanted most in life was money, and they found an ingenious way to obtain it through racketeering. The two young gangsters would develop a protection racket where they threatened to set fire to push cart owners' merchandise unless they paid a dollar for protection. Most of the time, the cart owners would refuse to pay any money to Siegel, with the majority being relatively low on cash and just seeing him as some jerky neighborhood kid. However, Siegel was not the type to take no for an answer, and he would douse their carts in kerosene, light them on fire, and demand payment yet again. The push cart owners would then have no choice but to pay from fear of having their business set aflame a second time. Or worse. Beyond this, Siegel and his fellow gangsters would run bootlegged liquor to local speakeasies and naturally got into fights with rival gangs, including butting heads with the early beginnings of the New York Mafia. In 1918, Siegel would befriend another Jewish youth named Meyer Lansky and the two would form a gang called the Bugs and Meyer Gang. The gang would engage in activities other than petty theft, upgrading to gambling and car theft, and later down the line, committing murder. Siegel was nicknamed Bugsy because of his violent temper that he was quick to fall into. Many of his companions would state that he was crazy as a bed bug. But despite the nickname sticking with the media, Siegel hated it and would attack people who called him that particular name. It reminded him of his youth as a poor kid growing up in Brooklyn, but no matter what he tried, 
The name became naturally stuck to him. Meanwhile, as the Bugs and Meyer gang was stepping up their criminal activity, Lansky felt that there was a need to organize the boys in the Jewish community to form even more organized street gangs. And over the years, Siegel and Lansky would be involved in much more intensive criminal behavior. Siegel worked in bootlegging and was the hitman that Lansky would hire out to other crime families. And eventually, their gang would transform into an actual organized mob that mainly handled bootlegging-related hits across New York and New Jersey. The organization would grow to include numerous Jewish mobsters on the come-up, including Abner Zwillman, Louis Buchalter, Jake Lansky, and Joseph Stature. The group operated in a cutthroat manner, taking out rival gangsters on the orders of other gangs, while moving illegal alcohol across the city. Meanwhile, Siegel also befriended a man named Al Capone, a local gangster who worked as a bouncer at a mob-controlled nightclub. At some point in the 1920s, police were searching for Capone on a murder charge, and Siegel allowed the young gangster to stay at his aunt's place while hiding out. Siegel's next venture would then be to operate in the drug trade, seeing all the profits that other gangsters were making. By the age of 21, he became insanely wealthy dealing opium. He would use his newfound riches to purchase an apartment at the Waldorf Astoria, and later, a luxury home in Scarsdale, New York. He was a figure of the New York City nightlife, and he would enter lavish bars and clubs and flaunt his wealth to everyone around him. His life had changed drastically from the young, son of poor immigrants that he once was. Siegel would also marry his childhood sweetheart named Esther Krakauer, and they would have two daughters, Millicent and Barbara. However, he had a reputation of being a womanizer, and even though he was married with children, he often cheated on the side with women he'd meet through his work or his appearances at clubs. Throughout the mid to late 20s, Lansky and Siegel would begin fostering connections to the Italian Mafia, namely through two men, Salvatore Lucania and Frank Costello two fellow young gangsters who worked under a man named Arnold Rothstein, a prohibition mentor who was raising them to operate in the city's underworld. In known reputations as paid hitmen, the Meyer Siegel mob would soon be involved in a brutal mafia war when Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano began to struggle over bootlegging territory. During the 1920s, the Italian Mafia operations in New York had been controlled by a group of men, the largest one being Giuseppe Masseria, more commonly known as Joe the Boss. Masseria's gang included a faction that was composed mostly of gangsters from Sicily, Calabria, and Campania. Included in this faction were Frank Costello, Salvatore Lucania, and Albert Anastasia. Things would change, however, when Sicilian Mafia boss Vito Ferro decided that he wanted to take control of the Italian operations overseas. Ferro was the boss of Castellamare del Golfo, and from there, he would send Salvatore Maranzano to battle Masseria and seize control of the New York Mafia. However, there had been internal family warfare in Castellamare del Golfo, and a lot of that fight was brought with the group of immigrants that arrived in the US with Maranzano. Coming with Maranzano were Joe Bonanno, Stefano Magadino, Joe Profacci, and Joe Aiello. They began recruiting more and more individuals on the street to back up their faction for the looming battle that lay ahead of them. There was more to the Castellamarese war, however, than just the feud between Masseria and Maranzano. The true motivations of the war ran deep in the history of the Sicilian clans and their leadership. A generational conflict between the old and new Italians created rifts in how they would deal with other groups. The old-school mafiosi, like Maranzano, refused to do business with non-Italians, while the younger generation, the men who grew up in America like Lucania, Costello, and Lansky, were more open to working with other groups of criminals. And this rift led many of Masseria's followers wondering how he himself would lead the Mafia in the 1930s. But a lot of men in the street felt that the concept of a war was unnecessary. Lucania, now known as Charles Luciano, wanted to modernize the dealings and the ways of the Mafia, him working with Lansky and Siegel as a sign of this. 
He felt that the old guard were holding the organization back, and his vision for the future of the mob led many of the younger guys in his generation to follow him, and with his influence, they became unsatisfied with Masseria. As the war raged on in New York and across the United States, major gangsters getting gunned down left and right, Luciano and Costello decided that Masseria's time as leader of their group had to come to an end. Luciano cut a deal with Maranzano, and on April 15, 1931, he organized a hit on his own boss. Four hitmen would be dispatched to kill Masseria, Benjamin Siegel, Albert Anastasia, and Anastasia's friends Vito Genovese and Joe Adonis. The four men entered a bar where Masseria was sitting playing cards and shot him to death. Suddenly, within only a few minutes, the brutal Castellamarese war was over, and Maranzano came out on top, appointing Luciano as one of his top captains. However, he himself realized that Luciano was no ordinary gangster. He was a threat to Maranzano's operations, and if Luciano was capable of turning on his old boss and killing him, what was to say he wouldn't turn on Maranzano? Maranzano decided to be proactive about the situation rather than to be murdered first. And so, in September of 1931, he hired an Irish gangster named Vincent Cole to finish off Luciano. However, Luciano would be alerted by Tommy Lucchese that there was a hit out on him. On September 10, Maranzano ordered Luciano and Genovese to come to his office at the New York Central Building in Manhattan. Luciano knew, however, that if he went to that meeting, he would never leave that office in one piece. So he decided to retaliate. Instead of going to meet Maranzano, Luciano sent four Jewish gangsters, whom he'd met through Lansky and Siegel, to go down to the office. The four were unknown to Maranzano's people, so there wasn't really any way to identify them as actual threats. The four disguised themselves as government agents and went up to the office. Two of them disarmed Maranzano's bodyguards, while Lucchese went with the other two to point out Maranzano. The two disguised Jewish gangsters proceeded to stab Maranzano several times before ultimately shooting him to death. The media dubbed the assassination the Night of the Sicilian Vespers. Maranzano was dead, and Luciano was now in control, having eliminated his two largest rivals from right under their noses. He organized the state of the New York Mafia and opened up their operations to more diverse groups of criminals, including the Jewish mob of Lansky and Siegel. It's May 1929 in Atlantic City. Located in New Jersey, Atlantic City was infamous for being a gambling hotspot and a central hub for crime operations across the country. During a conference in the city, several members of the criminal underworld across the United States would meet up to establish what would be called the National Crime Syndicate. At this meeting, men like Al Capone, now the largest crime figure in Chicago, Benjamin Siegel, Frank Costello, Dutch Schultz, and others are in attendance. The mafiosi who met determined that a central organization was needed to coordinate activity between the many crime groups of the American underworld, and Luciano was placed as the head of the committee. Composed mainly of Italian and Jewish gangs, the conference would also be the day that the enforcement arm of the underworld, Murder Inc., would be established. Murder Inc. was a gang of mafiosi based mostly in Brooklyn, headed by two men. Lepke Buchalter and Albert Anastasia. Siegel and Lansky were also involved in forming the Hitman crew, and with time, Buchalter and Anastasia grew a long list of employees. Buchalter was born Louis Buchalter in the Lower East Side of Manhattan to Russian Jewish parents. The name Lepke came from a Yiddish nickname his mother gave him, Lefkele, meaning Little Louis. In the year 1909, Buchalter's father would pass away when the young boy was only 12. He finished his elementary school and began a job selling theatrical goods 
Schultz, was a good student, reportedly on the honor roll at the Rabbi Joseph School. However, his mother would soon move away for health reasons to Arizona, leaving Buchalter in charge of caring for his sister, a task that he would not be successful at accomplishing. Buchalter would be arrested for the first time on September 2nd, 1915, for burglary and assault, but luckily for him, the case was discharged. Still, this would begin Buchalter's entrance into the world of crime, and not too long after being let go, he moved in with his uncle in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but was arrested for burglary charges not too long after, and would move back to New York in 1917. In that same year, Buchalter was sentenced to 18 months in Sing Sing, on a conviction of grand larceny, and would then be transferred to Auburn Prison and released in only two years. He would find himself at Sing Sing again the next year, 1920, for 30 months on charges for attempted burglary. After being released in 22, Buchalter began working with a childhood friend of his named Jacob Shapiro. The two began a scheme to gain control of the unions in the garment industry, turning the unions on factory owners to threaten strikes and demand weekly payments from their employers, all while taking money from the unions for themselves. The operation was extremely profitable for the men, but was pivotal in Buchalter's criminal career with the unions continuing to remain under his control and bring him heavy cash. Eventually, he would form an alliance with Lucchese crime family head Tommy Lucchese, and the two men, working together, would take full control of the New York City garment industry. Anastasia was born Umberto Anastasia in 1902 in Parielia, Calabria, and in 1919, Anastasia and his brothers Joseph, Anthony, and Gerardo would illegally enter the U.S. after deserting a freighter they were working on in New York City, soon beginning a career as Brooklyn and longshoremen. Anastasia would quickly rise to power in the late 20s, becoming a major leader in the Longshoremen's Association, and he controlled six chapters of the Brooklyn-based labor union, and would eventually ally himself with Giuseppe Masseria, and later down the line, Donis, Luciano, Costello, and others. As a result of their leadership structure, Murder Inc. consisted of two factions, one of them being the Jewish Brownsville Boys. This faction was headed by Abe Rellis, and reported directly to Bu Coulter and Shapiro while the other faction, the Italian Ocean Hill Hooligans, was led by a man named Harry Mayone. They reported to Anastasia, and while all this was going on, Siegel remained as a hitman across the group. Members of the Death Squad were gangsters from Italian and Jewish gangs all across New York City, with most of their criminal activity focused in New York. The enforcers accepted contracts to kill from mob bosses all over the US, however, and the group based itself out of a candy store called Rosie Gold's. Murder Inc. had a good number of members, but their most prominent killer was Harry Strauss, who used many methods to kill his victims and would never carry a weapon on him, using any tool he found nearby to do the job in case police ever arrested him or tried to question him. The killers were paid as though it were a regular job with fees ranging from $1,000 to $5,000 per kill. Their families were also compensated monetarily as benefits. The group was powerful, terrifying, and they got things done. Anyone who needed someone gone, tortured, or intimidated went straight to Murder, Inc. And as the years went by, the group accumulated a victim's list in the hundreds. In 1931, Murder Inc. would work to eliminate the Shapiro brothers, Meyer, Irving, and William. The Shapiro trio were leaders of a group of Jewish American mobsters from New York City. They had good ties to the garment industry, which at that time was still dominated by Jacob Shapiro, unrelated, and his friend Buchalter. The fact that the Shapiro brothers had to answer to the Murder Inc. mafiosi, however, would spread a conflict and incite a power struggle. The Shapiros then tried to murder two men, Relis and his friend, Martin Gold. Stein. The hit on Rayless went unsuccessful, but Mayor Shapiro abducted his girlfriend and raped her in the process. Mayoni and Abandando joined up with Rellis and Goldstein, and the four were now out for the Shapiro's blood. On July 11, 1931, Irving Shapiro was gunned down near his apartment, and then on September 17, Mayor was found shot to death in the basement of a tenement building on the lower east side of Manhattan. Around 1932, a local bootlegger named Abe Wagner informed police about Murder, Inc 
and shortly afterwards fled to St. Paul, Minnesota to avoid pursuit. However, he would be found and killed by George Young and Joseph Schaefer, but the killers were caught and arrested, and Siegel wasn't able to get them off the case. Sometime after the founding of Murder Inc., Siegel would come to have a falling out with two other men, the Fabrizio brothers, associates of Waxy Gordon. Waxy was born to Polish Jewish immigrants in New York, being named Irving Wexler at birth. He was a skilled pickpocketer as a youth, and would eventually be employed by Arnold Rothstein as a local rum runner. Gordon would eventually be in charge of all of Rothstein's bootlegging operations throughout the East Coast, namely in New York and New Jersey. He had Canadian whiskey smuggled across the border in massive amounts, and then sold off to local bars, clubs, and speakeasies. He achieved a decent amount of wealth from this, netting $2 million a year just for himself. With his newfound wealth, Gordon began to buy breweries and distilleries, while speeding around town in limousines and staying at luxury hotels. He had mansions built in New York and Philadelphia, and he was leading a comfortable and extravagant life. That extravagance, however, wouldn't last too long. In 1928, Rothstein was murdered. This wasn't too helpful for Gordon, though, as his position began to decline. Without his mentor, Gordon's popularity began to dwindle, and people weren't super enthusiastic towards him, regarding him less than they used to. At the time, he had a large million-dollar operation that included trucks, buildings, plants, and employees. However, his business front couldn't account for his operations and his cash flow as he was paying no taxes for all the money he was making. There was one thing the gangsters were often caught for, it was tax evasion. It was questionable how he was walking around town with hundreds of bills stuffed in his pocket, but zero dollars in actual income. Gordon would make an alliance with Luciano, Bucalter, and Lansky, just before the syndicate was formed. There was a constant air of conflict around him and Lansky. The two men fought often over bootlegging and gambling interests, which would eventually spark a new gang war. Associates of the two men were killed, but Lansky decided he'd retaliate in a more interesting way. Instead of taking violence, he and Luciano supplied information to Thomas E. Dewey, the interim U.S. attorney, and revealed Gordon's tax evasion practices to the government. This led to Gordon's conviction, in 1933. Not too long after his conviction, his son was on his way to the courthouse to plead with the judge to give his father leniency. He was a medical school student and the grandson of a rabbi, but on his way to the courthouse, he passed away in a weather-related car accident. The death of his son and his imprisonment put a strain on his marriage even more, and when Gordon was released from prison, he came back to a world that had abandoned him. His gang was disbanded, his political connections didn't care for him anymore, his wife was gone, and so too was his wealth. He was no longer the important man he once was. Out of rage for what the Murder Inc. gangsters had done to him, Gordon hired the Fabrizio brothers to try and assassinate Lansky and Siegel. The assassins made entry into Siegel's fortified Waldorf Astoria suite with a bomb down the chimney, but their attempt failed. Siegel would later hunt the brothers down and kill both of them. One of the Fabrizios, Francis, had begun drafting a manuscript for a memoir to expose the mob and its death squad. One of the longest chapters in the manuscript was related to Murder Inc, specifically Siegel, but the gangsters were able to discover that he was writing the book before he could get it out. Fabrizio had gone into hiding at his parents' apartment at 6207 Fort Hamilton Parkway, but they found out where he was living anyways. Siegel and two others posed as detectives and entered the home where Fabrizio was eating dinner with his family. The three killers told the family they needed to get Francis, flashing fake police police badges, and they drew him outside and mowed him down where he stood. Meanwhile, William Shapiro, the last of the Shapiro brothers, was also murdered on Bucalter's orders on July 20, 1934. He was buried alive in a sandpit by Reles, Abandando, Mayone, and their associates, the Amberg brothers. And with his death, ended the long conflict between Murder Inc., the Fabrizios, and the Shapiros, but the hits didn't cease. In 1935, 
an intense rivalry formed between the Amberg brothers and the rest of Murder Inc. over a loan sharking related conflict. The Amberg brothers, Joseph, Hyman, and Lewis, were competitors in the racketeering business in New York. And as a result of this, their opposition was now their once associates in Murder Inc. On September 30, 1935, Joseph Amberg and his associate Morris Kessler stopped by the Blake Christopher Auto Garage before they would set out to collect protection money from businesses in the area. They began to leave, but before they could, three unidentified gunmen entered the garage, forcing the two men against the wall at gunpoint. The gunmen then proceeded to shoot Amberg and then Kessler, and police found Kessler dead with a gunshot to the forehead and three to the back and Amberg's body shredded up by the bullets. On October 23rd, 1935, Louis Amberg was found murdered in the back of a flaming car, stripped of his clothing, a sack over his head, and his hands tied with wire. The string of murders, however, didn't end there, and their next target was Dutch Schultz. The Schultz hit would go on to be their most infamous murder, and he was slated for death after he openly defied the National Crime Syndicate regarding Thomas E. Dewey. In October of 1935, Schultz insisted that a contract be put on Dewey's head, as he'd been attempting to put the mob out of business. Dewey was a famous man at the time, a district attorney that would later become the governor of New York. He was also a man who was relentless in his pursuit of the Mafia in the United States, and his first major move on the gangsters was Gordon's tax evasion conviction. It earned him his name in the media, and his reputation only grew when he charged Luciano with forced prostitution in 1936. Dewey was attempting to put Schultz behind bars as well, and that pissed the mobster off, so much so that he wanted Dewey six feet under. Dewey had taken Schultz to trial before, the first ending in a deadlock. Before the second trial, however, Schultz had the location moved to Malone, New York. And in Malone, he gained the sympathy of the townspeople through charitable acts. In fact, his work was so impactful on his reputation that when it came time for his trial, the jury couldn't bring themselves to convict him. Dewey, unsatisfied, threatened Schultz with instant arrest and even more charges. Schultz decided that Dewey would need to go and planned to have Dewey murdered while the prosecutor made his morning call to his office from a payphone near his home. The syndicate didn't accept the idea of assassinating Dewey, however, fearing that it would cause public outrage rage, make police attempt to shut down the rackets with more force. Luciano was especially displeased with the idea to have Dewey clipped, but the following year, he'd be hit with Dewey's prosecution. Schultz, however, was angry and determined enough that he would take matters into his own hands. He didn't feel like waiting around for Dewey to put him behind bars as well, but the syndicate couldn't let that happen, and so they hired out Murder Inc. to deal with the problem. It's now October 24, 1935. Schultz is sitting down for a meal at the Palace Chop House restaurant, located in Newark, New Jersey. Sitting alongside him at the same table are three other men, his accountant Otto Berman, his lieutenant Abraham Landau, and his personal bodyguard Bernard Rosencrantz. Schultz excuses himself to go use the men's room when suddenly, two strange men enter the restaurant, Charles Workman and Emmanuel Weiss. Workman walks over to the bar and then makes his way over to the men's room, where he comes face to face with Schultz. Without a moment's hesitation, Workman opens fire, Schultz falls to the ground, Round, and Workman and Weiss advance on the rest of the table. The three other men died instantly, but Schultz survived just by a thread. Weiss immediately fled the restaurant, escaping with his driver, Seymour Schechter, but accidentally leaving Workman behind. Schultz was rushed down to the hospital, where he then passed away. In September of 1936, Joseph Rosen, a man who ran a successful trucking business, would be murdered by Murder Inc. as well. The then confectionery shopkeeper had supposedly threatened to go to the authorities over the tactics used by the mob. Bucalter issued a contract on Rosen to prevent something like that from happening. Members of Murder Inc. then entered the trucking business and gunned Rosen down, leaving his body on the floor. At least 20 detectives were assigned to solve the case, but for the moment being, it would go cold. Sometime in 1936, Siegel, being watched closely by authorities, decided to pack up and move west to California, where he would settle in Los Angeles. He feared prosecution, or worse, an exposition of the Murder Inc. group and decided to take his business elsewhere, although he still did hits on the other side of the country. 
Siegel was very popular amongst the LA elite, and made good friends with people in Hollywood, directors and movie stars alike. He also set up gambling dens and offshore gambling ships, while adding more onto the prostitution, narcotics, and bookmaking rackets in the city. His life in Beverly Hills was extravagant, and he made good friends with an actor named George Raft. With Raft's contacts now as his own, Siegel began to extort film studios to finance his lifestyle, while exerting control over movie production. Things were going good for the gangsters, even with Siegel's departure and Schultz's murder, but unknown to the hitmen, the years ahead would prove to change everything for murdering. Across 1937, the murders committed by Murder Inc. just went up. They would kill anyone, from loan sharks to suspected informants, and their work left behind a trail of bodies that would also lead to the slow demise of the organization. George Rudnick was Harry Mayone's next victim. Mayone was a hitman in Murder Inc., known for his permanent scowl, which netted him the nickname Happy. In his early years in the mob, he led the Ocean Hill Hooligans, the Italian street gang that answered to Anastasia, and was now involved directly in Murder Inc.'s activities. Meanwhile, his victim, Rudnick was a loan shark that was suspected of being an informant to the police by Bucalter, who then, as part of the course, ordered a hit on the man. Mayone, Abandando, and Strauss went to Rudnick, killed him, and began stuffing him in the back of their car. However, as they were doing so, they found out he wasn't dead yet. Strauss then grabbed a nearby ice pick and stabbed Rudnick 63 times, while Mayone chopped at his head with a meat cleaver. After Rudnick came Walter Zagotsky. Zagotsky, later changing his name to Walter Sage, was a taxi cab driver in Jersey City until the year 1930. He ended up joining a Brownsville gang run by Abe Rellis and worked as an enforcer for the group. The gang operated at least a dozen rackets, including slot machines in areas across New York City. Sage was sent to oversee the slot rackets in the Sullivan County hotels, and was known for being kind and helpful to his neighbors. He was a well-dressed and quiet man, but he made a serious mistake against his supervisors that would end with his life being taken in a brutal fashion. After Sage had been sent to oversee the slot machines, the gang came to find that he'd been skimming a percentage of the profits and netting it for himself. The gang decided to teach him a lesson, and so, on July 27, 1937, Sage was picked up from his room at the Ambassador Hotel by his roommate Irving Cohen and their mutual friend Jack Drucker. The three drove up to the Hotel Evans in Loch Sheldrake, but they weren't alone. Behind them was a car being driven by Abraham Levine, and next to Levine was Strauss. During the drive, Cohen began to strangle Sage, while Drucker began to stab him in the chest with an ice pick. He was able to put up somewhat of a fight, grabbing the steering wheel and getting the car to fall into a ditch. As Drucker tried to attack Sage, he missed and hit Cohen in the arm. Levine and Strauss were able to then locate the car and found that by the time they arrived, Sage was dead. To send a message to anyone who thought to do the same, Strauss and Drucker tied up Sage's body to a slot machine and a 30 pound rock then drove it down to Swan Lake and dumped him in the water. However, Sage's body eventually came up to the surface on July 31st, and Cohen then went into hiding. Henry Millman was their next victim. He was a prominent member of the now defunct Detroit Purple Gang, and following the elimination of his gang across the Prohibition era, joined up with the local Detroit Mafia, became a very prominent figure. He was a proud man who hated the Italians and constantly butted heads with their leadership. In August of 1937, there was an attempt on Millman's life where he was nearly blown up. However, that assassination failed. The local mafiosi all agreed that Millman needed to be taken out. On November 25th, 1937, he was shot to death outside of Boski's restaurant, likely by Strauss and Mayone. The shooting also wounded four bystanders as his two killers took off into the night. 1939 saw the death of another gangster. Irving Feinstein. Feinstein was a Jewish American mobster that had heavy involvement in illegal gambling and labor racketeering with Bucalter. However, he'd made the mistake of attempting to encroach on turf that didn't belong to him. It was also believed that Feinstein had double-crossed Vincent Mangano, the boss of the infamous New York Mangano family, 
the same family that Albert Anastasia now worked for. Harry Strauss, Abe Ellis, Martin Goldstein, and several other murder ink gangsters lured Feinstein to Ellis's Brooklyn home on Anastasia's orders. There, Strauss began to attack Feinstein with an ice pick, but Feinstein fought back and bit out parts of Strauss's hand. The gangsters then decided to make Feinstein suffer, so they beat him down and looped a tightrope around his neck and legs, causing him to accidentally strangle himself. The murdering hitmen then took the body to an empty parking lot and set it on fire. Harry Greenberg was an associate of Siegel and worked under Luciano and Lansky. Born to Jewish parents in New York, Greenberg had been tied to organized crime for a good portion of his life. He was first arrested in September 1927, for drowning a man named Benjamin Goldstein in order to collect 70 grand in life insurance, but was acquitted for the murder. On November 11, 1928, Greenberg was again arrested alongside many other members of Murder Inc. while they were meeting to discuss Gordon. However, they were let go. Greenberg was also involved in the deaths of the Fabrizio brothers. And in 1936, he was ordered to raid the office of the Needle Trade Workers Industrial Union while they were in a meeting. However, Greenberg would meet his end in 1939 at the hands of his own co-workers. Apparently, he'd attempted to extort Bucalter some $5,000 to keep his silence. Otherwise, he would spill crucial details to law enforcement. Bucalter didn't care, however, and instead ordered Greenberg's murder. On November 22nd, 1939, Greenberg was killed by Siegel, Whitey Krakow, and Frankie Carbo, the latter being a soldier of the Lucchese family. Apparently, Siegel had brought them to his house and drove the getaway car, and while inside the home, Carbo shot Greenberg five times. That same night, the gangsters dumped Greenberg's body on his own driveway, and he was discovered by his wife. In 1939, Albert Schumann would also be clipped by Murder Inc. Schumann had been allegedly working with police on an inquiry into Lepke's involvement in labor racketeering. And Anastasia caught onto the situation and ordered that he be taken care of. Relis, Bucalter, and Weiss worked to plan the murder, while Anastasia told the men to bring in a man from outside the Brooklyn group to take care of Schumann. And that's where Irving Nitzberg came into play. Nitzberg had been brought into Brooklyn from the Bronx and was picked up by Rellis. Schumann was sitting in the car with the men as well, as Rellis had convinced him that they were simply going to perform a robbery. Nitzberg got into the back seat alongside fellow hitman Albert Tannenbaum, who then looked at him and provided him with the signal. Nitzberg then pulled out his gun and fired at Schumann, hitting him twice in the back of the head. Tannenbaum and Nitzberg then got out of the car, joined Rellis and another gangster a getaway vehicle and drove off from the scene of the crime. Nineteen forty would see the beginning of the downfall of Murder Inc. and its associates. In January of that year, Harry Rudolph, a professional criminal and police informant, was held as a material witness for the murder of Alex Alpert. Back on november twenty fifth, nineteen thirty three, nineteen year old gangster Alex Alpert was murdered on a back street corner in Brooklyn by Rellis, Goldstein, and their associate Anthony Mafatore. Rudolph spoke with Brooklyn District Attorney William O'Dwyer and managed to secure first-degree murder indictments against all three of them. After the indictment, O'Dwyer learned from Special Prosecutor John Harlan Amon that Rudolph was reportedly offered a $5,000 bribe by another prisoner on behalf of the syndicate to put Rellis and Goldstein back on the street. When Mafatore learned of the bribe, he decided to flip and provide evidence to the state. Detective John Osnato spoke with Mafatore, stating that he had not played a role in the Alpert murder, but that he was a driver and six others. Mafatore convinced Abraham Levine to talk as well, and after him came Rellis. Harry Mayone and Frank Abandando were the first members to be put on trial for their work in Murder Inc. The trial for the murder of Rudnick began in May 1940. Strauss had also been indicted for the murder, but also agreed to cooperate with the DA. Suddenly, over the period of only a few days, everything began crashing down for the gang. Rellis played a pivotal role in most of the trials and testimonies, providing details that would prove to be immensely important to the overall outcomes in sentencing. Although Rellis had been a heavily involved member 
member in the Hitman crew. He testified in the Rudnick murder, stating that Rudnick had a hit put out on him after Strauss claimed he obtained information that Rudnick was an informant. According to Rellis, he had waited outside the garage while Mayone, Abandando and Strauss were inside with the turncoat. Abandando then called for Rellis and called over Angelo Catalano, their associate, in order to help move the body. Rudnick was still alive at that point, and it was then that Strauss and Mayone finished him off in the brutal fashion that they did. Catalano would be the driver of the car that held the body in the trunk. During the trial, Catalano had been called in and corroborated Relis' story, confirming the murder and how it went down. Two other men, Afatore and Levian, also testified, stating that they had stolen the car that was used to dispose of Rudnick's body. Mayone and 14 others testified that Mayone had been in his grandmother's house during the murder of Rudnick for a funeral, but the funeral home undertaker and embalmer testified that he wasn't at the wake at all. That further damage to Mayone's attempts at getting himself out of trouble, one of his most important witnesses admitted to the jury that he had been ordered by Mayone's brother to commit perjury, and he was afraid for his life. During the trial, Mayone was reportedly smug and arrogant, responding with sarcasm and joking answers, although he often denied doing things asked of him. The jury found the evidence and witness testimonies against him convincing enough to have him officially sentenced. May 23rd, 1940 marked the first convictions in the case against Murder Inc., with Mayone and Abandando both being convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to death by electric chair. The New York Court of Appeals, however, was able to overturn their conviction on a 4-3 vote in December of that same year, but the victory was short-lived when the case went to trial once again. During the trial, Mayone reportedly lost his temper at Relis, throwing a glass of water at him. Still, despite any attempts to get out of the case, the criminal pair would be convicted of first degree on April 3rd of the following year, and they would be sentenced to chair again on April 14. This time, the Court of Appeals upheld the sentence, and on February 19, 1942, Mayone and Abandando were led to the room that housed the infamous Sing Sing electric chair. Harry Strauss and Martin Goldstein were put on trial for the 1939 murder of Irving Feinstein, who had faced one of Murder Inc.'s most brutal ends. The trial began in September of 1940, with Strauss attempting to fake insanity to get out of a murder conviction. Relis was the chief witness in the case as well, testifying that Feinstein had been murdered on Anastasia's orders after supposedly crossing Mangano. Relis told the court that he and two other men had murdered Feinstein in his home, backing up Relis was his mother-in-law, who testified that Relis and Strauss had asked her for an ice pick and a clothesline earlier that day, the two items used in Feinstein's death. She also stated that she heard a lot of loud music and a commotion in the living room, even hearing Strauss yelling that he'd been bitten. Backing up the story as well was Goldstein's former bodyguard and driver, Seymour Magoon, who testified that on the night of the murder, Goldstein told him that he, Relis, and Strauss had all murdered Feinstein. Goldstein also allegedly told him that he and Mafatore burned the body afterwards. Goldstein's attorney didn't put up a defense, but Strauss's attorney attempted to work in an insanity plea. He was allowed to take the stand, but began babbling incoherently and refused to take his oath. He was taken off the stand and at the defense table began to chew on the leather strap of a briefcase, but it was in vain, as the court was unconvinced and the two men were convicted of first degree murder. A week after the conviction, they were sentenced to the chair as well, and on June 12, 1941, Strauss and Goldstein were executed. Things weren't looking good for Murder Inc. On March 27, 1940, Charles Workman was indicted in Schultz's death. Workman was extradited to New Jersey in April of 1941, and the trial began in June of that year. Relis and Tannenbaum were the primary witnesses against him. The trial began with two state witnesses, the bartender at the palace shop and a woman who had been standing outside the restaurant. They were asked if they recognized Workman, but the two failed to identify the gangster. On the following day, Relis and Tannenbaum provided their testimonies, implicating Workman in the murders. After the two men was a female friend of Danny Fields. Fields was one of Bucalter's payroll collectors, but had been killed years prior by Murder Inc. around the time of Schultz's murder. She testified that workmen showed up at their apartment the day after the death, 
requesting that Fields burn his clothes. The woman then said that Workman openly spoke about the Schultz killing and spoke about how he had been left behind in the restaurant. Emmanuel Weiss, the other hitman, had taken off from the restaurant without Workman. Workman's defense countered with testimony from Marty Crompier, a close associate of Schultz, who had been shot on the same night that Schultz was murdered. But Crompier was shot all the way in Manhattan, while Schultz was in New Jersey. Crompier testified that Tannenbaum had told him that he didn't shoot him because he had been in New Jersey, and that he'd been behind the killing of Schultz. Another defense witness, a funeral director in Manhattan, claimed that Workman had been employed by him during the time of Schultz's murder, but the witness happened to be Fields' brother-in-law. He would later recant his testimony, effectively canceling out a potentially convincing way to get Workman off the hook. Seeing that he was damned, Workman changed his plea from not guilty to no contest, and on that day, he was sentenced to life in prison, but would be paroled 23 years into his sentence. Irving Nitzberg was put on trial for the 1939 murder of Albert Schumann, and the testimony in his trial was provided by Relis, Tannenbaum, and Magoon. Although they provided detail on how Nitzberg was the gunman, the conviction of murder was overturned on a 43 vote by the Court of Appeals on December 10, 1941. The Court of Appeals had questioned the use of testimony of non-accomplice witnesses who were promised leniency if they supported the testimonies read to the jury by Relis. On November 12, 1941, however, the star witness in all of the trials by then, Abe Relis, would fall out of a hotel window. Staying at the Half Moon Hotel in room 623, Relis fell to his death from the window. According to police, it appeared as though he may have been trying to bring himself down to the fifth floor using two bed sheets tied together and a four foot wire that had been attached to a valve inside of the room. Investigations revealed that the wire knot on the valve came undone, causing Relis to fall onto a landing on the hotel's second floor. The media dubbed Relis the canary who could sing but couldn't fly. Although Relis had been guarded by five individual officers, they weren't able to prevent his death causing them all to be demoted. With Relis' connection to the high-profile murder ink, theories began to sprout up everywhere. Many speculated that he'd been pushed out the window by an attacker, and that the room was arranged with bedsheets to make it seem like he was attempting to escape. Police, however, had no reason to believe at the time that he meant to escape since he apparently feared being too far from his protection duty. To this day, it's not confirmed if Relis indeed died in an escape attempt, or if he was murdered by his old accomplices. Nitzberg would be tried again and convicted once more on March 12, 1942, but the conviction was once again overturned, with the court dismissing the indictment as faulty, since the only testimony was from accomplices without corroboration. They read Relis' testimony aloud, but without him there, there was no possibility of adding further details compared to the first trial. Other associates in Murder Inc., like Philip Cohen, had his murder indictment dropped before the trial began, since he was convicted on a federal narcotics charge and got a 10 year long sentence. James Ferraco, another hitman, had vanished from the picture, and it was assumed he'd been killed around the start of the trial. As for Bucalter, securing a jury for him proved to be difficult, with jury selection beginning in August of 1941 and the trial starting the next month. Rosen's wife and son, a teacher and a turncoat named Shalom Bernstein respectively, all provided testimony against Bucalter. Bernstein had apparently been marked for death after refusing to murder Irving Cohen as a part of a contract. Cohen had fled to California after Walter Sage's murder back in 1937. November 30, 1941 arrived, and Bucalter, Weiss, and Louis Capone, their associate, were all convicted. The Court of Appeals upheld the convictions the following year, but Bucalter didn't stop fighting in the courts even requesting for the U.S. Supreme Court to hear his case. However, the Supreme Court refused in February of 1943. In March, the Supreme Court reversed its decision and decided to review Bucalter's conviction, but in June, they decided to uphold it, so it made no difference. Bucalter was set to be executed, but before that could be done, the New York State needed to get him back from the federal government, since he was serving a 14-year-long federal sentence. He continued fighting, trying to appeal his death sentence even after being transferred at a federal prison, but the inevitable was inevitable. On March 4, 1944, Bucalter, Weiss, and Capone were all executed in the Sing Sing electrical chair.
Vito Gorino was another member of Murder Inc., who police sought out for questioning. He was described as being unorthodox, practicing his gun skills by killing chickens. He was an enthusiastic hitman and helped Abandendo and Mayone murder Cesare Lataro and Antonio Siciliano, two men who had been trying to take control of the Plasters Union in New York. Gorino was also ordered to silence a man named Joseph Liberto, a witness to the George Rudnick murder. Gorino attempted to convince Angelo Catalano, another witness in the murder, to hide out on Long Island, but he was picked up by cops on the streets of Brooklyn shortly after being bailed out by the syndicate. In dealing with Liberto, Gorino attempted to play a diplomatic role with the man. He took Liberto to a house on Long Island and treated him to dinner, but Liberto felt that something was off and dashed out of the house at the first chance he got. He jumped out of a window, but was arrested by police not too long afterwards. Gorino used a contact in the Queens County Jail, a deputy named Sheriff William Caselle, to enter the county's civil prison and force Liberto to meet with Gorino. Liberto was pushed up against a wall in his cell and threatened with death if he cooperated with the district attorney. Gorino asked Liberto if he was going to be a stand-up guy, and Liberto agreed that he would. Gorino then instructed him to ask the deputy for anything he needed, and he actually came back a few days later and offered to take Liberto for a ride outside. Liberto, fearing that he would be murdered, told Gorino he wasn't planning on going anywhere, and the two men began to argue before Gorino left. He then asked the officer to not let Gorino back in, and eventually called his lawyer. Gorino went into hiding in New Jersey, and for the most of 1940, he remained hidden. On September 12, police arrested him at the Church of the Guardian Angel in Manhattan. He's found screaming hysterically out of fear for his life. He then confessed that he'd been involved in three syndicate murders, and he played a role in four others. He was sentenced to 80 years to life in prison in April of 1942, but was booked at the Denimora Hospital for the criminally insane, where he would pass away 15 years later. Walter Sage's murder trial involved Jacob Drucker and Irving Cohen, who were tried separately for the death. Cohen had fled to California, fearing that he'd be killed after Sage's murder, and while there, had secured a few small roles in films at the time, and was identified by Abraham Levine, who spotted him in a crowd scene in the film Golden Boy. Cohen testified against Levine, saying that Levine stabbed him with an ice pick when he was walking home from a casino, as he refused to pay up a 25% profit on a game of chance claiming that Drucker had sent Levine. Cohen was acquitted on June 21st, 1940. As for Drucker, the man was a fugitive for over three years until the FBI found him in Delaware. Drucker was convicted of second-degree murder on May 5th, 1944, and he received 25 years to life in prison and would later die in Attica 18 years later. Another murdering hitman, Jack Parisi, was acquitted of two murders, Morris Diamond, a Teamsters official, and Irving Penn, a music publishing executive. Penn had been mistakenly killed in a case of mixed identity. The intended target was Philip Orlovsky, a Cutters Union official, but he had left his home early that day to go for a shave, and the killers jumped on the wrong man. Jacob Midgen, an accomplice in the Penn murder, who made the identification mistake and was a fugitive for many years, pleaded guilty to attempted first-degree assault in the middle of his trial and only got 5 to 10 years behind bars. Judges couldn't convict Parisi on any of the murder charges, as there was a lack of corroborating evidence due to the chief witnesses also being accomplices. He ended up dying out of jail as a result of natural causes at the age of 83. Hitman Max Golob was indicted alongside Frank Abandando for first-degree murder, in the March 3rd, 1935 murder of John Murtha, there wasn't much evidence aside from the eyewitness testimony of Murtha's girlfriend, and Golob pleaded guilty to a charge of second degree assault and only got five years. The trials of murdering star hitmen quickly destroyed the organization, and the group would vanish within the span of only two years. For the few that weren't put on trial, arrested or executed, not all of their ends were pleasant. In 1942, Mafatore and Levine received suspended sentences after the two pleaded guilty to petty larceny and the theft of a car used in a murder. In 1949, Philip Cohen was murdered after being released from federal prison, getting out after a decade-long narcotics trafficking sentence. Mafatore was arrested yet again in October of 1950 for grand larceny, 
as he'd been a member of a nationwide auto theft ring and was supposed to make a scheduled appearance in the Queens County Court on March 7 of the following year. However, he never showed up and was never seen again. On October 25th, 1957, Albert Anastasia would be sitting at the barber shop at the Park Sheraton Hotel in Manhattan when two masked gunmen came in and sprayed the place with bullets, killing Anastasia in the gunfire. He'd been murdered on the orders of his own second command, Carlo Gambino, and their once friend, Vito Genovese. And after his death, and all of the things he'd done to secure his position in life, his rackets were simply distributed down to other criminals. As for Gordon, he moved to California and obtained 10,000 pounds of coupon ration sugar during World War II to illegally sell on the black market. He also formed high-level connections to international narcotics trades and was given the US West Coast as territory to distribute legal drugs after the loss of his East Coast bootlegging business. In 1951, however, Gordon was caught and arrested after trying to sell heroin to an undercover police officer. He was 62 at the time and joked with the officer that he'd give him all of his money if the officer agreed to release him. But the cop obviously refused. A depressed and old Gordon began pleading to be killed instead of being sent back to prison, but he was sentenced to 25 years in Alcatraz. He died of a heart attack only a year later. Siegel, one of the original members of Murder Inc., would live up the rest of his life in California as a Hollywood superstar and a celebrity gangster who was always in the media. However, he would meet his end in the same place he enjoyed a grand amount of his success. He'd been given major loans by his supervisors in the Mafia to open large casino properties in Vegas and to run them under the mob's umbrella. In the early 40s, he built the city up into a mini gambler's paradise but problems began to arise in the construction of the Flamingo Casino. His girlfriend, Virginia Hill, had stolen some two million out of the casino project under his own supervision, or lack thereof. During a 1946 meeting in Havana, Cuba, it was decided that he was causing more problems than he was solving. On June 20, 1947, Siegel was sitting with his associate, Alan Smiley, in Hills' as Beverly Hills home. But while sitting near a window inside the house, an unknown man standing outside raised a 38 caliber carbine and sprayed the gangster where he sat. Meyer Lansky would live out the rest of his life in peace, making tons of money and retiring to Miami, where he died at the age of 80. Murder Inc. was one of the most brutal, violent, and intense gangs in American mob history, and although they only operated for a number of years, their work left a lasting impact and a trail of bodies behind them. To this day, it isn't confirmed how many people Murder Inc. was responsible for killing. And as things stand, it's likely that most of their victims' bodies will never be found, putting a bizarre, violent, and mysterious ending to the murdering story.